says, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and I'm alive forevermore then. I want to say to you today, and he still is. I want you to shout with me, and he still is. Father, bless us now as we preach the word of God. Give us to preach with power and authority on this Easter Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I preach, I want to acknowledge Sister Sharon Dooley. You and uh, your husband, we were praying for you as you were away. He lost his mom. I pray that everybody's doing well, and it's good to see you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Hopefully, you could feel our prayers and our support mean the world to us. Uh, today, we talked about the, the fact that um, John, by the time he received this letter, or he wrote this letter, or received this revelation from God the Father. John was a 90-year-old man. This is the same John who wrote the book that bears his name, the gospel that bears his name, the book of St. John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He is the one who was called Jesus' beloved disciple. He is the same John uh, who, when Jesus was dying on the cross, assigned, uh, gave him the assignment of taking care of his mother. Is that amazing? While Christ was dying on the cross, bless you, he interrupted death and said, he stopped everything and said, John, take care of my mama until I return. Amen. This was John, uh, the disciple. Peter and John, a mighty man of God. Peter's brother, John. By now, all of his compadres, his companions, his fellow ministers, the original 12, were dead. He outlived them all. Um, he even survived an attempt at martyrdom that was uh, placed on him. They tried to kill him by dipping him in boiling oil. By the grace of the Almighty, John survived. And we find him in the text. He says, I'm on the island called Patmos. Patmos was no vacation spot. Patmos was a prison island. We talked about it this morning. I won't go into all of the details. But it was a harsh place. It was a place where... Criminals and ne'er-do-wells and wicked men were sentenced to live out the rest of their days in prison doing hard labor. The ground was of, it was very rocky. It was of volcanic ash. Nobody would want to be there. And uh, the Romans had their guards there with their ready whips in hand to whip anybody to beat them either to death or into subjection or submission or to get them back to work. If anyone fell behind, they were in trouble. This 90-year-old man did not have an armor bearer. He did not have anyone to help him. He had to pull his own weight on in this horrible place. And this man who had dedicated his life to Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. He was a, before he met Jesus, he was a, a businessman. 
He was a fisherman by trade. Uh, he wasn't trained in rock crushing. He wasn't a rock crusher. He was a fisherman. So the environment that he was in now was one that was different from what he had, from, from what he had been accustomed to. Are you following me? There was no bed in his cell. Um, food was scarce. And there were no other Christians there. A home of cutthroats and wicked men. And one of the wonderful things about John, as he found himself in this horrible place, he did not have his lip stuck out. He never said, if you read his writings, you don't get from his writings that he felt that Jesus let him down. He never felt that his years of serving, uh, for all the years he put in, of serving the king of kings, that the king did him wrong. Amen. He didn't say, Jesus, how could you let me end up in this place with all that I've done for you? We couldn't, we wouldn't have done it. Christ would not have gotten past our attitude. Because all of us now, most of us, we serve the Lord for reward. We, we, we serve him for what we can get out of him. And if he doesn't give us what we want, then we are upset. As a matter of fact, we have no use for the Lord unless the Lord is doing our bidding. Most of us aren't servants of the Lord. We serve the Lord because we want the Lord to be our servant. Amen. And the moment he fails to move when we say move. The moment he fails to deliver, please don't let a loved one die and you've been praying and believing God for the Lord to heal that loved one. I don't care if the loved one is 300 years old. If that person passes away, now we're angry and we don't understand why God would allow such a thing to happen. Now you're bitter. There are parents who were saved and loved the Lord and their child died. And they've been bitter with God ever since. They don't see how the Lord could let their child die when children die every day. It's amazing what misfortune tends to do to us today. That we view the Lord as a genie in a bottle. And we rub that genie, rub that bottle when we want something. And we expect him to appear and grant us three wishes. And the moment that he doesn't, the next thing I know, we're either online or in a record store or somewhere talking about church hurt. And how there's no hurt like church hurt. And how the saints aren't loving and how the Lord did me wrong. I paid my tithe. I gave my offerings. I went to church and I don't understand why I'm in this predicament. John said none of that. Did I mention that he was 90 years old? Did I mention that he'd given his life to Christ? That I'd mentioned that he even gave up his career. Jesus said, give up your career. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. They left a lucrative fishing business to become Jesus' disciples. And with all of that, all of that, here he is. God bless you, Heath. Here he is now on a prison island, locked up in a harsh place, hungry all the time, 
And yet he knew that he was right where the Lord wanted him. I, I want to say this. Um, uh, we, we've got to serve the Lord uh, for the right reasons so that we can serve the Lord for a long time. Because I'm going to tell you, between here and heaven, every one of us is going to have a Patmos. Every one of us are going to go through a time in our life or times where it seems as though we didn't get out of it what we put in. Where it seems as though God was unfair. And you'll say, how could the Lord, after I did all of this, how could the Lord let this happen to me? You know, the Apostle Paul, he, he boasted. He, he bragged in the Lord. But his boastings were very different from the way we boast today. The boasting that we hear today in Christ, we boast on the things that the Lord has done for us and on the multitude of things that God has given us. And we stand up and we thank the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with thanking God for his goodness, his kindness, and his tender mercy and thanking God for his spiritual blessings, material blessings, financial blessings. I personally think there's something wrong if you do not. But, there is something wrong when you have just so much thanks to give him when things go your way and nothing to say when things do not. There is something wrong when you can preach and sing and perform and, and sing on the choir and lead praise and worship and do all the things that we do when we feel good. And everybody knows it about a scar on your face when you feel bad. Paul in his boastings, would you bear with me for a few minutes? I'm going to preach today, but I, I want you to get this. In, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, I believe in letting the Bible do the talking, Paul says, I say again, let no man think me a fool. And he says this, if otherwise yet as a fool, receive me. He says, I don't want you to think that I'm a fool. But on the other hand, <laughs> um, on the other hand, put up with me as though I am a fool that I may boast myself a little. He says, I want to brag for a few minutes. Now, I don't want you to think I'm a fool. But Clifton, but if you do think I'm a fool, Put up with me for a minute because I need to brag a little bit. Because Paul considered boasting foolishness. He said in verse 17, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. That is, he says, I am not after, um, this is not a commandment that the Lord has given me to say to you. But as it were foolishly. In this confidence of boasting. He says, I'm getting ready to self-glory. He says, God hasn't told me to do this, but I'm going to do it. So, I'm telling you now, if I sound foolish, you know, um, just put up with me, he says. He says, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Since others brag, then I am going to join in this also. He says, for you suffer fools gladly. He says, you listen to, he could fuss, Paul could fight. He says, for you tend to listen to fools on a regular basis anyhow. So since you do, listen to me. The Bible is something, ain't it? Uh, seeing yourselves are wise. Since you are so smart, then listen to me. For you suffer. Here's what you put up with. If a man bring you into bondage, Put you under, under false regulations. You put up with it. If a man devour you, if a man financially take advantage of you, you put up with it. If a man, look at this, if a man take of you, that is, if, if, he, if a spiritual leader treat you as his prey, you put up with that. And if a man exalt himself, you put up with it. If a man smite you, there were some 
in the church at Corinth that were literally, can you believe this, physically striking people uh, in the name of the Lord. He says, you even put up with that nonsense. He says, I speak concerning reproach as though we had been uh, weak. How be it? Wherein soever any is bold. And he says, look, I tell you, I'm speaking foolishly. I am bold also. He says, uh, verse, verse 21, he says, to my shame must I admit that I have been too weak uh, to boast, but now, just like others have been boasting, I know it's foolish, I've got to do it. And, and some of those people who were boasting, they boasted on their Jewish ancestry. So in verse 22, he says, are they Jews? He says, so am I. Are they Israelites? He says, so am I. You know, some people today, the woke movement, well, you know, if you're, if you're truly black, you got to be woke. If you're a true black man, you're woke. Well, if you're a true black man, so am I. That's the point. That's the point. That, that, that's the point he's coming from. All right? So am I. So he says right here, um, he says, are, uh, are they, verse 22, the seed of Abraham? He says, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Paul says again, parenthetically, I speak as a fool. I am more. I'm more of Christ's minister than they are. In labors, he's boasting now, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in imprisonments more frequent, in deaths. Of the Jews, five times received our 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was beaten with rods. Once was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Does anybody see a pattern? In weariness, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting, not because he chose to fast, but he had no food, often in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Concerning the church, who is weak? And I am not weak. Who among you is weak and hurting? Paul says, and it doesn't affect me. Who is offended? And I am not offended. I carry your burdens. He says, if I must need glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Notice what's the point in this exercise. His boasts were in the things that he could take. For the Lord. His boast was in the things that he was able to suffer and endure. Our boast is in the number of cars that we own, in the number of houses that we own, and how much we paid for that suit, and, and how much we paid for the rings on our fingers. Our boast is on the quality of the sheets on our beds. This man's boast was there was a time when I didn't have a bed. Isn't that amazing? See, let me tell you, you, you got to shift. You can't just boast on, it's, it's, your, your boasting can't be just simply when God does things for you. You got to be able to see God in it and be grateful when things are not going your way. Amen. So we find John. Bear with me just for a few more moments. On the Isle of Patmos, 90 years old, grateful, believing that God, he didn't think that God had forsaken him, but he knew that he was there by the Lord's design. And you know where we found him? We didn't find him 
in mourning. We didn't find him somewhere having a pity party. We did not find John on this island, the only saved man there, um, somewhere seeking a psychiatrist. But the Bible says in verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit. This phrase will, was not an uncommon phrase used at the time that simply means worship. He said, I was in worship on the Lord's day. He didn't even say I was somewhere begging God for relief. He didn't say I was somewhere asking the Lord to make things better. But he on that island somehow found a place to steal away and to have church. Oh, how different uh, he was than we are today. Saints, let's learn to worship the Lord even when things aren't going our way. He was, he was somewhere by himself saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're mighty. Thank you for letting me walk with you when you walk this earth. Thank you for letting me be there when you walked on water. Thank you. I remember when you transfigured and I saw it. Thank you for the miracles. I was there when you fed 5,000 with two little fish and five barley loaves. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you. I was there to see it and to experience it for myself. And I worship you. He was in the spirit. On the Lord's day. Ah, he was in the spirit. Praise the Lord. Bible says in John 4 and 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's a spirit. And we have to worship him with, with the right attitude. And according to the scripture. Amen. And he said that he was in the spirit, listen to this, on the Lord's day. This is a new designation for a day of the week. This is the only instance in the New Testament that the first day of the week is called the Lord's day. And from the day John called it the Lord's day, it has been called the Lord's day Ever since. Saints gather on the first day of the week. Being Sunday. Acts 20 and 7 speaks of the saints gathering on the first day. 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 speaks of the first day of the week. Why did John call Sunday the Lord's day? Because according to John chapter 20 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, Mark chapter 16 and verse 2, Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. These passages tell us that Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week by God the Father. Sunday is a special day. You know, it's amazing now what we do, what we find to do on the first day of the week. Oh, with more, many times now, on the first day of the week, people are out on the soccer fields. At 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, children out there kicking some little silly ball. Which, by the way, they just did had a report the other day. Do you not know that the sport that is the number one head in injury sport uh, that exists today is not football? It's soccer. They're having more concussions and head in injuries from that than anything else. And you got your children out there getting, getting their bells rung early when they should be in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, I often talk about these uh, sporting uh, uh, institutions that on church time, somewhere playing ball game, on the Lord's day. 
I must have a lot of sports fans in here today. I can't get an amen, but you know I'm right. Sometimes we find people out running and jogging. Praise the Lord. On my way to sunrise service this morning, a man out on a bicycle ride. Thank God he had a light on the back. I didn't see him until I got right up on him. But I, was, I was praying. Glad I didn't hit him. On the Lord's Day, sunrise service, he goes for a bicycle ride. But John understood the significance of this day. God the Father didn't flip a coin and just decide he would raise Jesus from the dead on, on, on the Lord's Day. It was by design, divine, divine design that God would use that day. It is the Lord's Day that we remember the victory that Christ won over death. That's why we don't have funerals here on the Lord's Day. It's not a death day. It's a life day. Amen. We celebrate the day that Christ gained victory over death. Somebody say the Lord's Day. So we find John here in the spirit. Let me move fast. On the Lord's day, celebrating Jesus. And while he was in the spirit, uh, there's a show out today that they call The Voice. Uh, I used to watch it, but after I saw one uh, church minister of music, one church leader too many, going on the show selling out, I lost interest in it. Amen. Uh, you going to still watch it, but I... I I see, I, that's the devil. That's the devil. You, you go on there, and my name is Minister So-and-So. I'm a music leader. And then you go on and perform all of the R&B, hip-hop, rock and roll, all that just selling out to, uh, to the world for a contract. And it seems like the contract never comes. You, you know, sold out, and you still ain't got no money. And the church ain't going to invite you back either. Let me tell y'all something. The world laughs at us. Hollywood producers and the world laugh at how easy it is to get a Christian, uh, to a Christian to sell out. Muslims don't do it. When's the last time you heard somebody? Don't you think um, Nation of Islam people can sing? Don't you think that these people in these, some of these foreign religions? can sing also, but they're not going to sell out their religion uh, to be able to, to get a camera. Many of us will do anything. As a matter of fact, the talk, the laughing talk in Hollywood is that a black minister will do anything if you promise him a mic and a camera. He'll get involved in a reality show. He'll make a fool out of himself on television. He'll hook up. They'll sing with Snoop Dogg, Jay-Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They'll, they'll, they'll be in this movie and that movie. Anything for fame. Oh, preacher, it's Easter Sunday. Do you have to go there? Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing what has happened to us. But on that day, John said, while he was in worship, he heard a great voice. He heard a great voice behind him. And uh, he said, uh, behind me, a great voice, as of a trumpet. Now, immediately, John runs into problems because he struggles now with describing properly what he saw. For he, what he heard, for he didn't hear a trumpet. He heard a voice. You know, the human language is inadequate to describe the glory of God. So he reaches out to get the loudest instrument that he could find to describe the sound that he heard. And he heard a voice behind him that sounded like a trumpet. Good God Almighty. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, he, and the Bible says... And I heard this great voice like a trumpet saying, and listen to this, the voice said, 
I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. Could you imagine being in worship in a place by yourself? You know that there's nobody else that's saved and there's nobody else in service with you. And all of a sudden, behind you, you hear this loud announcement. Woo! What is, what is the significance of saying I'm Alpha and Omega? This, the voice he heard was the voice of uh, announcing the sufficiency of Christ. I'm everything you need from A to Z. God Almighty. And said the things, did I tell you he was 90 years old? The things that you're about to hear, I want you to write them and send them to the seven churches in Asia. And uh, he said with his uh, 90-year-old self, and I turned. To see, look at this, I turn to see the voice. I heard a voice, uh, but I wanted to see what this is. That is behind me because you see, he had not heard Jesus' voice in a very long time. It's been at least 60 years. Since he'd heard the voice of Jesus. For Jesus had ascended back up into heaven. And he had not heard the Lord's voice. So he turned to hear the voice that was behind him. And when he turned to see this spectacle, this voice, uh, and, and being turned. Notice how he he feels in the blank. I turned and being turned, what I saw was I saw seven golden candlesticks. Hallelujah. Which is symbolic of the church. And just for a little history lesson, Exodus 25 and verse 3 in the, in the 25th chapter of Exodus and uh, around the 31st verse. That's when God first tells Moses to make a golden lampstand with seven prongs, which would represent then the tabernacle. And then later on in Zechariah, the chapter four, we see the seven golden candlesticks again, which represents the temple that would be rebuilt. And uh, here in our text, we see the seven golden candlesticks, which represents the church. And in the Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, we see the same seven golden candlesticks which represents the church in heaven. So John looks back and he sees the church on earth. And he sees Jesus standing in the midst of the church. Verse 13, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, there was one likened to the Son of Man. With a, look at this, clothed with a garment, glory to God, down to his foot. Hallelujah. He was dressed, oh my God, with, uh, in divine garments, down to his foot. And a gird, girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Hallelujah. And this garment represents his being dressed, listen to this, like a judge. God Almighty, Jesus dressed like a judge standing in the midst of the church. And then he said, uh, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Can I get a witness? And this affirms his deity. Glory to God. This white hair. Uh, if you read Daniel chapter 9, you'll see how this is, chapter 7 and verse 9, how it affirms the deity of Christ. And his hair was white uh, as of wool and, and white like snow. And his eyes was as a, as a flame of fire, which represents his all-seeing eyes. Matthew 20, 10 and 26 
Read it when you get home. Hebrews 4 and 13. I want you to know Jesus sees what we're doing. And his feet was likened to fine brass as if they had been burned in a furnace. Brass is always judgment. And his voice as the sound of many waters. The voice of the eternal God. I'm glad that Jesus didn't have a weak little voice. But Jesus had a powerful voice. This is Christ glorified. And his voice sound like many waters. It sound like a tornado. It sound like a hurricane. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. The seven stars was the preachers of the church. And his countenance was as the sun in its strength. Jesus was shining like the noonday sun. Good God Almighty, standing in the midst of the church. I feel my help. And when I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet. What he said, what he saw was too much. It was too much for him to bear. The glory of the glorified Christ was so powerful that he could not stand up under that glory. And he fainted when he saw the glory of the Lord. I'm glad, uh, did I tell you he was 90? That this 90 year old man didn't have a heart attack. <laughs> he fell out, but while he was out, the Bible said, and he laid his right hand upon me. <laughs> Good God Almighty saying to me, fear not, fear not, for I am the first and I am the last. Now I want you to know that when Jesus called himself the first and the last, he actually called himself God. For in Isaiah, are you praying for me? The chapter, uh, thank you Jesus, if you look at Isaiah, in his writings, Isaiah tells us that, that the, the first and the last is a title that God held for himself. Isaiah 44 and verse 6 says, Thus saith the king, the king of Israel, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And then in Isaiah 48 and verse 12, he says, Hearken unto me, O Jacob, call by my name, for I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. So when Jesus called himself the first and the last, Jesus called himself the eternal God. And as the first and the last, he's the absolute Lord of history and he is the creator. So Jesus is the God of all history and he's the God who made everything. He's the first and the last. And then he goes a little further and he says, I am he that liveth. He says, I am the living one. I cannot not live. I am the I am God. I am the God of necessary existence. The one thing that the God of the Bible cannot do is that he cannot not exist. He liveth forever. He is. Who made him? Nobody made him. Can you go back in time before that was him? No, because he created time. Can you go back to a place where God did not exist? No, because everything comes from him. I'm glad today that I served a God who made everything. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm he that liveth but guess what? And was dead. He, he said, was dead. Not, I'm he that liveth and was passed out. 
Not I'm he that liveth and went into a coma. Not he that liveth and they thought I was uh, in a suspended state of animation. No, sir. Jesus died. See, had he not died, there would be no atonement. Had Jesus not died, Easter wouldn't mean anything. Had Jesus not died, we'd still be in our sins. The only way for the price to be paid is that God had to die for your sins and mine. How many are glad today that Jesus died? He died for me. Brothers, y'all will be all looking at me, bring me up a little bit here because we're getting ready to go home. Look at your name and say, I'm glad he died. I'm glad that he died. There are some false teachers who teach that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, but that he only appeared to die. But no, sir, Jesus was dead. When the soldiers got to the two men that was on the cross with him, they found those men were still alive. So they broke the bones in their bodies so as to hasten death. But when they got to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. And that's why they didn't break any bones. And it had already been prophesied that not a bone in his body would be broken. Jesus, he didn't die from the crucifixion. He just died on the cross. The crucifixion didn't kill him. He died on the cross. What killed him then? Nothing killed him. No one killed him because he couldn't be killed. The Bible tells me that when the time was right, Jesus cried out to tell us to tell us that is, it is finished. And the Bible said that he hung his head and he gave up the ghost. He told death, you can come and take me now because death couldn't kill him. Did you notice that when Jesus was here on the earth, nobody ever died in his presence. And when he came across people who were dead, when he got ready, he raised them from the dead. And you know the story that when they brought him to Lazarus' tomb, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But you know what we say, that it's a good thing that he said, Lazarus, come forth. For had he just said, come forth, then everybody who was dead would have got up from the grave. Thank you, Jesus. He's a mighty God. Somebody lift your hands and give him praise in this place. Ah, he died. Somebody shout, he died. Ah, yes, he did. Ah, yes, he did. But what I'm glad about is that he didn't stay dead. He said, I'm he that died, but I'm alive. Some people say that Jesus would do it all over again. No, he won't. He died one time, and he will never die again. He said, I'm alive forevermore. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, oh, my fear is gone. And I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Oh, because he lives. Yeah. Yeah. I need a few hundred folks to just shout, he lives. He lives, he's alive, he's living in my soul, he's living in my 
heart and I can feel him all in the room. Yes! Go on and celebrate his life. His Lordship. Celebrate. Celebrate that he's alive. He said, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. 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 You can't kill him. Can't stop him. He's invincible. He's got all power. Amen. Put a, you can put a period on it. The devil can try, but he'll never be able to kill Jesus. And then I heard him say, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Oh, Lord. Keys symbolize authority. Keys symbolize power. Keys symbolize X access when you have keys to a room you can get in when you have keys to a door you can get in Jesus said I have the keys of hell and death that is I am the one who decides who lives and who dies I'm so glad that my life is in his hands how many are glad that your life is in his hands if you're glad about it if you're glad about it praise the Lord oh, ah, praise the Lord Woo! Take your neighbor's hand and tell him, neighbor, that means that the devil can't kill you until Jesus is ready to take you. Cancer can't. High blood pressure can't. Jesus has the key to hell and death. And in my clothes, I just want to tell you everything that he claimed to be back then. He still is today. He's the one that has the power to keep us. He's Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek al alphabet. That means he's everything that you need from A to Z. He's the first which means in place of order, he's first and the last. That means he's the most remote. If you go back as far as you can, he's still there. If you go up in the future as far as you can, he's still there. Our God is all sufficient. Our God, he's the one. He's everything you need. Somebody praise him because he's every, every, everything you need. Won't he keep you? Won't he make a way for you? Won't he heal you? Do I have any witnesses that can say when they were sick, he healed their bodies? When you were down, he lifted you up. When the devil came against you, then the Lord make a way for you. Good God Almighty, when the world says you're done, then Jesus step in on time. And when I was lost and on my way to hell, I heard, I heard a story about how my Savior came from glory. He bled and died on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Then I cried, oh, I cried, oh, Savior, come and heal my wounded spirit. And somehow, somebody
Somebody shout on somehow. Somehow, Jesus came and brought me the victory. He's the same God today as he was back then. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's here to see you through. He's here to keep you on Patmos. He's here to lift you up. He's here to give you power. I need a few folk to just praise the Lord. But wait a minute. I don't want you to praise him for his bringing you out of your situation. Because I'm telling you right now, he's going to bring you out. I want you to praise him while you're in it. I want you to praise him while you're waiting. I want you to praise him while things are not the way you want them to be. But you know that sooner or later the Lord will fix it. But I find that if you live for him, he'll give you freedom in the fire. He'll give you joy in sorrow. He'll give you hope for tomorrow. Yeah, yes he will. Woo! If I'm talking to you, give him praises today. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Y'all leave him alone. Leave him alone. Just leave him alone. He's all right. He ain't bothering nobody. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. And pitied my every groan. As long as I live and trouble rise, I'll haste some to his throne. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, Lord, I haste. Oh, I haste. I'll hasten to. What are you saying? I'll run to the altar. I'll get down on my knees. I'll do like John did. I'll get in the spirit. Somebody get in the spirit and give him praise right now. Woo! He hadn't heard Jesus' voice in over 60 years. And lo and behold, <laughs> he looked back. There's that familiar voice. Last, last time I heard it, we were whoo. Going, we were going up and going down. Up and down. Up and down. In and out. Lightning flashing. Rain everywhere. Up, down. The waves lift the ship way up. Drop the ship way down. And somebody went down in the boat and woke him up. And said, carry us down not that we perish. And uh, Jesus got up with all that was going on. And with that same voice, said to the stone, Peace, be still. John said, I know that voice. And when he said, Peace, be still, the wind stopped blowing. The rain stopped falling. The sea calmed down. And I heard the disciples say, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the rain obey him. He was blind. Couldn't see. And a man came and laid hands on him. Scale fell from his eyes. Sight was restored. 
The man's name was Saul. The man who prayed for him, his name was Ananias. And when Ananias prayed for Saul, scale fell from Saul's eyes. Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost. He later became the Apostle Paul. And Saul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was touching the law. He was a Pharisee. He knew what he knew. But he didn't know Jesus. Jesus had just saved him. He said, I'm saved, but I don't know him. And I heard him when he looked at Ananias and said, Ananias. Ananias. Tell me what kind of man Jesus is. Ananias, Ananias, tell me what kind of man Jesus is. Listen, spoke to the wind, and the wind obeyed. Tell me what kind of man Jesus is. He touched my soul, and I got saved. What kind of man Jesus is? Somebody said, Ananias, Ananias, tell me what kind of man Jesus is. Good God of love. Oh, Ananias, oh, tell me what kind of man Jesus is. Gotta leave, but let me just say, oh, he spoke to the wind, and the wind obeyed. You tell me what kind. Somebody clap your hand. He touched my soul, and I got saved. I said, oh, what kind of man Jesus is? your neighbor I don't know your neighbor's name but if you know them call them by the name and just ask them what kind of man Jesus sees oh and not yeah you gotta tell me about Jesus tell me about the man could walk the water. Tell me about the man who could calm the raging seas. Tell me about the man who made, made me whole. I got something on the inside and I'm filled with the Holy, Holy Ghost. You gotta tell me, you gotta tell me, you gotta tell me. They killed him on the cross but he rose from the dead and a few days later he ascended to heaven and I had him say I'm coming again and I'm not yes yeah, yeah. Oh, you gotta tell me about Jesus you gotta tell me about the law Praise the Lord. Somebody lift your hand. Somebody give him glory. Jesus. Woo! Oh Lord. Tell me what 